Good morning, Castleberry family. Thank you for joining us today. I want to remind you this morning how important it is to be faithful during this time we're going through, to gather your family together every time we have service as a group, and take part when these messages are being sent out to you by our church. You guys know that there are times when, even as Christians, you can tend to get a little bit lazy about church attendance. You have to admit it. Sometimes you don't go because it's cold or it's raining outside. Sometimes you don't go because there's something else you'd just rather do. Sometimes you don't go because you're just tired or you just don't want to. Well, I believe the Lord deserves a better place in our lives. And my friends, believe it or not, sometimes Christians can even get a little bit lazy about something as simple as getting the family together and turning on the computer and watching the church service online. How easy is that to do, yet we get lazy about it? You know, about a month ago when we first had to start broadcasting like this, there were so many church members getting online, watching these services. They seemed excited about it, so excited about it. So many people got on that social media sites like Facebook and YouTube were having trouble keeping up with it all. But as I feared, many Christian people have even gotten lazy about this or lost interest or they've been distracted by other things and they feel uh, that other things are more important. Sadly, viewership has gradually began to take a downward turn across a lot of churches. And I just want to encourage all of you during this time to make this a top priority in your home. Don't let anything distract you from this because it's so important. Now, I also want to say, please don't get used to this. While we do plan to continue to offer our online outreach of our services after this crisis is over, we also plan to get back together physically soon. And when we do, it's going to be a great day, and I hope you'll be here with us. And though we're doing the best we can right now as it is, yet there's still no substitute for actually gathering together with God's people as a church family to study the Word of God and to worship Him together. Now, according to what our state and local leaders are telling us right now, and while we are prayerfully considering some of the best legal advice we can find from the National Center for Life and Liberty, we're looking forward to the possibility of meeting together in our church building again, Lord willing, on Sunday, May 17th. There's a possibility it could be even a week sooner. So please just be praying about that, and we will do our best to get all the information out to you as the final plans are put into place. Now also, with that in mind, uh, Mother's Day is coming up, May the 10th, and I want to let everyone know a couple of things about that. First of all, we have a beautiful gift from the church that we want to give to all of our mothers. And if it becomes possible for us to meet on May 10th, we'll be giving them out on that morning during church. If, however, we're not able to meet here, we do invite you in that week of Mother's Day to call the church office during the week, and, and our church staff will make an appointment for you to come by and pick up your Mother's Day gift. We'd love for you to have that. Secondly, we're planning to put together a very special Mother's Day video where whether we can be here and watch it at the church together in person or if we have to watch it online. But I believe either way, it's going to be a very special video that we're all going to enjoy. And so we want to ask you to bring pictures of your mother uh, up to the church. You can bring a, a baby picture, you can bring a, a grown-up picture, whatever you have. Bring them to the church office during the next couple of weeks. Or you can scan them and you can email them to us at castleberrydifference at gmail.com. We need to, you to get these to us as quickly as possible and be sure to uh, include the information uh, with them about it's with your, your name, with your mother's name. Uh, label them if you bring physical pictures. But I, I know this is going to be a very special uh, thing because moms do hold a very special place in our hearts. Also, let me just cover a couple of other things. When we do start to meet back together again, I want to assure you that we will be working extra hard to keep our building as clean and sanitized as humanly possible. Of course, if you're feeling any kind of symptoms, if you feel sick in any way, then, then please just stay home and we'll look forward to come, you coming back uh, when you're completely well. Also, a lot of people are very nervous right now about handshaking and hugging and fellowship time, which you all know I love, we love around here. So I just want to encourage all of you to be mindful and be respectful of others who don't wish to take part in any of that right now. 
And when we come back, if you feel like you don't want somebody shaking your hand or hugging you, you can just do kind of like the people do over in Hawaii or like in Asia where they just kind of put their hands to their chest and they say namaste. Do something like that. Everybody will understand and, and nobody's going to get offended. We'll all get along fine. I also just want to remind you that your generous financial gifts are what helps Castleberry continue to minister to this community and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ both here at home and all around the world. Our missionaries really need us right now. So I encourage you to bring your gifts by the church office or you can mail them in 1250 Jim Wright Freeway North uh, Fort Worth, Texas 76108. Or you can call the church office at 817-246-0191 to give your gifts by credit card or debit card over the phone and our church staff will be happy to help you with that. Finally, I just want to encourage you to trust the Lord during these times. Seek Him first. Don't be afraid. Our Father knows everything we have need of, and He will take care of us. I want to leave you with this scripture from the book of Job, chapter 19. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and He shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. God bless you, and please stay tuned now for our message. Our scripture text this morning is Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. We've come to Romans chapter 10 in our study this morning. We're going to start reading in verse 1 down through verse 4. Would you look at it with me? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Can we pray together? Father, we ask You to bless this message and do Your will in all of our lives, in all of our hearts. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, all the way back in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul made a statement to the people who were living in Rome in which he said, As much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. And all the way back there, we begin to see an urgency in Paul's words. This is not some trivial message Paul's trying to share. This is not some small idea of something small that he wants to do. If you've studied very much about the life of Paul, everything he did and everything he went through. And even if, if you're just reading Romans chapter 1, then you know that Paul has been traveling all over the world trying to share this message with everyone he could share it with. And in all his travels, he'd been through a lot of difficult situations. He had, he had enemies and that disputed with him and fought against him and, and persecuted him. And he spent nights chained up in prison, sometimes cold, sometimes sick, sometimes hungry. He was doing without. And these were times when his enemies uh, physically assaulted him. And on more than one occasion, they beat him within an inch of his life and left him for dead. And many people uh, facing that kind of opposition, they would have given up, would have quit a long time ago. But through every adversity, Paul just kept getting back up kept traveling to more cities where he could find more people he could keep sharing that gospel message with. And as he writes this letter to the people of Rome, he tells them uh, that it hasn't been easy. It hasn't, it's been very difficult, but I've been traveling all over the world and I've been doing everything I can to tell everybody I can the most important message in the world, this gospel message, and with all that's in me, with, with every fiber of my being, I want to come to where you are and I want to share this message with you too. That's what he's telling you. You know, it seems every time we turn on the news today, we see the president or we see some governor or some mayor or some city official trying to tell us what they think is the most important news of our day. They tell us we need to be careful. They tell us we need to stay at home. They tell us we need to wash our hands. We need to wear a mask. We need to keep our distance from people. We need to avoid large groups. 
uh, or we might get this virus or we might spread it to somebody else. And, and as important as that news may be or seem, I want to tell you Paul had some news that was much more important. It was the gospel message and he wanted to share it with everybody in this world. Now why was the gospel message so important to Paul? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 1 and 16, he said, for it is the power of God unto salvation. He said, I'm not ashamed of it because it is the power of God unto salvation. And what that means is that the gospel message, that precious old message about how God sent His Son into the world to die on a cross and pay the price for our, our sins, that precious old message about how Jesus Christ rose again, victorious over death and hell, that gospel message is still the only message that has the power to save us from sin and from hell. This gospel does a powerful work of God in people's hearts and in their lives. Back in Romans 3, we learned that there is none righteous, no, not one, nobody in the world. But then in Romans 4, we learned that just as it was with Abraham, the righteousness of Christ can be accounted to us by faith. And it is the gospel that does that. In Romans 5, we learn that even, that, that even though because of our sin, we used to be the enemies of God, yet now, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospel of Jesus Christ does that. In Romans chapter 6, we learn that sin used to rule over our lives. But when Christ died, we died to sin with Him. And we were set free from our old Master. And now we've been raised with Christ to walk with Him in newness of life. The Gospel of Jesus Christ does that. In Romans chapter 7, we learned about how prone we are to sin and temptation. Even though we're saved, we struggle in our flesh and we fail. Yet in Romans chapter 8, we learn that despite all our problems, despite all our failures, even still, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And my friend, it is the Gospel which does all that. And so that's why Paul had such a deep desire and was so willing to travel the world and go through all kinds of hardship and suffering so that he could share the Gospel message and so that people might be rescued from hell and receive the gift of eternal life and have their lives totally transformed by the power of this Gospel message. There was nothing greater that he hoped for in life than to see people saved. So as we turn our attention back to our text this morning, this is exactly where we're going to find Paul. Still heavenly minded. Still having a desire to see people saved. And, and that's going to bring us to our first point. We're going to focus on three things in this passage this morning. The first of which is, number one, Paul's emotion. We begin to see that in verse 1 of this text. Look at it with me. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And we already know from what we studied back in Romans chapter 9, the emotions that Paul's feeling for his, for his Israelite brethren is sadness. He's broken hearted for them because they, they have rejected Christ and they're lost and they're headed for hell. And we remember what Paul said back in Romans chapter 9 uh, in verse 2 where he said, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. He said, I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh who are Israelites. And he's so heartbroken for them and he had such a deep love for them that he says, if it were possible, if it would help them to be saved, then I would gladly be a curse from Christ. I would willingly be condemned to hell for eternity in their place. And the thing that's really amazing about that kind of love that Paul had for his brethren is the fact that these were the guys who had been pouring out all this persecution upon Paul. These religious Jews were the ones who were following Paul around from city to city and disputing with him and, and physically assaulting him. As we said a little earlier, they beat him senseless. One time they stoned him and left him for dead. And you might think Paul would harbor a little bit of resentment towards them. You might think he would have some anger and some bitterness in his heart toward these people, but he's not doing that. He's praying for them, for God to save them, and he's weeping for them because they're lost. And do you know why? 
Because Paul used to be one of them. He used to be a Pharisee. And he was, he, he was considered one of the, the smartest and one of the best of them. He knew all the right things and he said all the right things and he did all the right things. And, and he had a vast knowledge of the law of Israel and, and he kept all the religious rituals that there were to keep so that, so that the religious leaders looked at Paul and they, and, and they said, this guy has really got it together. We, we need to make him one of our leaders. And so, so Paul knows exactly, he knew exactly uh, what these guys were thinking. Paul, Paul knew what it was to be blinded and deceived by a false religious system that was keeping him away from Christ. Paul knew the battle that was going on in their hearts and he wept for them and he was praying for them and he was willing to go all over the world and endure through all kinds of suffering just so he could have another chance to share the Gospel with them. And oh, that we as Christians might have a heart that broken for the lost like that. That we might be willing to go. That we might be willing to tell others. That we might be willing to give up some of our comforts and some of our ease so that lost people who've never heard of Jesus might be able to hear the Gospel message and be rescued from hell. Aren't you glad somebody told you about Jesus? Aren't you glad somebody cared enough to share the Gospel with you? Don't you think everybody ought to have an opportunity to hear about Christ? Why don't you do this? In your prayer time this week and the weeks coming up, would you begin asking the Lord to give you a greater burden for the lost? How can, you know, how can we, we know uh, a, a truth? I, I, as, how can we know a truth that's as great as the Gospel message and not want to share it with others? How can we know a truth as important as the Gospel message and not share it with others who need to be rescued from hell. Would you pray for God to give you more of a burden for the lost? Would you pray for Him to give you more of a, a burden for missions, for lost souls around the world? Paul had this deep, deep desire. His heart's desire and his prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. Now the second thing we notice in this text is Israel's devotion. Look at verse 2 with me, because listen to what Paul says. First part of verse 2, he says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. They have a zeal for God. Okay, get what Paul's saying here. He says, I bear them witness. He's saying, I, I know them very well. These are the people I grew up with. I used to be one of them, so I can tell you about them. And, and what is it that Paul tells us about them? He says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. That word zeal, it means that, that they were very, very serious about their religion. They were, they were not at all lazy or half-hearted about trying to be obedient to the law of God. They had energy. They had an excitement in their hearts about trying to please God with their lives. These were not atheists, people. Paul wants us to know when it comes to, came to their religion, these were the most devoted people you could ever want to meet. But look at the second part of verse 2, because Paul tells us that there was a problem. Even though they were devoted, even though they, they had a zeal for God, he says, but it was not according to knowledge. Not according to knowledge. Paul wants us to know that these guys were deeply religious and they were trying harder than anybody else in the world ever had tried to please God. But he said, there's a problem. As hard as they tried, there's something really big that they missed because they didn't have the proper knowledge about the right way to do it. And he goes on to explain that in verse 3. He says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Alright, now, let's focus in on that word righteousness because it appears three times in that verse, so it's very important. And so let me just give you the simplest definition that I know how to give to help you understand what the word righteousness means. When we're talking about righteousness, what this means is that God is right. He's right in everything that He thinks. He is right in everything He says. He is right 
in everything he does. Everything about him is absolutely and perfectly right. Us, on the other hand, not even close. We're so flawed, and, and not, only, not only are we full of mistakes, but we're also full of intentional sins we've committed on purpose. And I guarantee you there's something in the lives of every single person listening to my voice this morning that you would not want displayed on a big video screen for people to see. There are things in your life that you are ashamed of, things that you don't want anybody to know about you because you know that they're wrong. And it's exactly the same with me and every one of us. But let me tell you, here's where Paul's Israelite brethren got off on the wrong track. And it's the same thing with many people that they struggle with still today. It starts with prideful thinking. We all have this natural inner desire to feel good about ourselves. We want to believe in our hearts that somehow we're good people or that we're at least good enough. We're not. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Easiest translation of that verse, none of us have been good enough for God. But Paul's Israelite brethren thought they could achieve that through their religion. And that's the way the Israelites were trying to do that, they, they, through religion. And Paul's telling us that the Pharisees tried harder than anybody else in the world. And they actually fooled themselves, they actually deceived themselves into believing that they were doing pretty well at it. But then Jesus came along, and He had some really bad news for them. And I want to take you over to uh, Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Take you to Matthew chapter 5, and I want to show you a couple of Scriptures in that Sermon on the Mount uh, that Jesus preached. I want to show you a couple of verses here of things that Jesus preached when He came on the scene. It's a great sermon Jesus preached, but Matthew chapter 5, verse number 19 and so if you look at it with me in your Bibles, Matthew 5, 19, Jesus said, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So understand, Jesus confronted the Pharisees, the most religious people that ever lived, the people who tried harder than anybody else in the world to please God. And He told them, it's not good enough, guys. Even if you've messed up on one of the tiniest of these commandments, you've failed. This righteousness that you guys are trying to establish for yourselves is not good enough. You're not entering heaven without, unless you reach a much higher standard of righteousness. Well, just how righteous do we have to be? I want to show you one more verse of Scripture in that Sermon on the Mount. You go down to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. This is what Jesus says. Jesus said, Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now that's God's standard. And it's not just good. It's not just close enough. It's absolutely perfect. And any commandment that's not perfectly kept even to the slightest degree, is a failure to meet up to God's perfect standard of absolute righteousness. Another word in the Bible that's related to God's righteousness that's used is the word holy. And the more you continue to study the Word of God, the more you get to know this book, the more you learn about the law of God, the things God does, the more you're going to come to realize that God is holy and you and I are so far from being holy, it's ridiculous. And it's no longer a matter of us trying to act better and trying to establish some semblance of righteousness with the life that we have left. Because if you're learning this book well, then you already know we've already messed up. And if you want to, to guard yourself from being deceived by the false hopes of the false religion of self-righteousness, then I would encourage you to spend more time reading and learning your Bible because this truth in this book is going to guard you from the danger of prideful thinking. And it's not only going to give you a mirror to look into your own life to make you aware of your own sin, but it's also going to give you a greater awareness of the holiness of God. Get this, my friends. 
the greatest danger of being sucked into all this deception of the false religion of self-righteousness is produced in the heart of people who are not living in a fearful and reverent awe of the holiness of God, which is produced when we honestly study the Word of God. Now I know it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very popular message in our churches today to tell people that they are good enough. We're having people preach that message in their sermons. They're singing it in the most popular Christian songs. One Christian singer says that, that it's a lie that says I'm not enough. My friend, the Scripture tells us that we're not enough. You must have Jesus. We're not enough. And so that's the lie that would say we are enough. My Bible teaches me about a man named Job. A man who the Bible says was blameless. A man who loved God and he shunned evil. And even God said that he, there was not another man like him in all the earth. Yet in the end of the story, when he was brought before the mighty presence of a holy God, Job said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, therefore I abhor myself. I despise myself. I loathe myself as a vile person. And I repent in dust and ashes. This is the man that God said was the best man on all the earth. Yet when he came into the presence of the holy God, he knew he was not good enough. And there are many very similar examples of such things in the Scripture. Isaiah was in the presence of God. He said, Woe is me, for am I, I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Peter, James, and John, during the transfiguration, they went up on the mountain with Jesus in Matthew 17, and simply they heard the voice of God speaking to them from heaven, and they fell down on their faces, greatly afraid. Now I want you to understand, that is the consistent record all the way through the Scripture, that because of the presence of sin in our lives, even the very best people, even the most religious people, even the most devoted and well-intentioned people in the world, have found that they're not good enough to stand in the presence of God. And that's an important thing because you and I, we're all going to stand in the presence of God one day. So no matter how hard the religious Jews tried to establish their own righteousness by, by the keeping of their religion, they failed. They fell short. And that's very sad. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story. Because our third point this morning is Israel's solution. And look with me at Romans 10 and verse 4. Romans 10 and verse 4 tells us Israel's solution. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay, listen to me now because here's the answer. We're not good enough because of our sin. The Bible makes that clear. We're not good enough. But Christ is good enough. And he, 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 he did this. He was good enough. He, he did this for you. Listen, I, I, want the word, I want the Word of God to set you free this morning from every lie that has kept you bound in the, the, the prison of false religion, of self-righteousness. Paul tells us here, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. And that word end, it comes from the Greek word telos, which it means termination. It's over. It's gone for good. I can't meet God's high, perfect, holy standard, and, 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 and I never could. But that's okay, because Christ already met that holy standard for me. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He lived a holy, sinless, perfect life. Not only that, but He went and He paid for my sins. He paid the debt when He died for me on that cross of Calvary. You don't have to do it yourself. Christ already did it for you. And He's offering it to you, not for a price, but as a gift. As it says over in Romans chapter 5, He's offering it to you by grace. He's offering it to you as a free gift. Paul tells us in Romans 5 over and over again, a free gift. You don't have to jump through any more religious hoops. There's no condemnation. God's not holding salvation over your head saying, you better shape up and act right or you're not getting it. He's telling you, 
It's already a bought and paid for free gift if you'll just be willing to trust Him and receive it. This past week I read a story about a guy named Harvey Pinnock. Harvey got a job working when he was an eight-year-old boy as a caddy on a golf course. When he was eight years old, and, and he, he worked there for many years, and so he had this unique perspective of watching professional golfers play the game from a very up-close viewpoint. And when he was very young, Harvey started um, carrying this little red notebook with him, and he, he started writing things down that he had observed out there on the golf course. And he never showed that little notebook to anybody except when he was older, he showed that notebook to his son. And it was years later, in 1991, his son took that notebook out and he showed it to a friend of his who was a writer. And his friend was just amazed by the things that he saw in that little notebook. And so he said, I really think I can get this, this book published. And he, and he took it and he showed it, he, he took it to... Uh, the place where he got a lot of books published, a, a big publishing company. He showed it to this giant publishing company called Simon & Schuster. And a few days later, the publishing company reached out and called Harvey Pinnock and, and made an offer to him of $90,000 to publish his book. Well, Harvey was just very quiet when he heard that. He seemed troubled and he said he'd have to take some time and think about it. And so for the next couple of weeks, the, they kept trying to contact him, and they, they were having a hard time getting a hold of him. But finally, they got a hold of him, and uh, sensing that something was wrong, they asked him, is there a problem with our offer? Harvey told him, I'm sorry, guys, but with all my wife's health problems and with all her medical bills, I just can't afford to give you guys $90,000 to get this thing published. And so they had to stop him and they had to explain to him, no, Harvey, we're not asking you to give us any money at all. We're not asking for any money at all from you. We just want to give you $90,000 to buy the rights to publish your book from you. And then you might even get paid a whole lot more based on how well the book might sell. Well, Harvey Pinnock's little red notebook was published and it sold over a, hundred, it sold over a million copies. And it went on to become the best-selling sports book of all time. I can't believe that's about golf. It ought to be about baseball, but it's about golf. And just think about the fact that he came, this guy came so close to totally missing out on all that success and all that wealth because he thought he had to pay for it himself. Listen, my friends, that is the tragedy of the false religion of self-righteousness. Because our loving Heavenly Father stands ready to freely bestow His eternal gift of salvation to anyone who will believe. But so many are right on the verge of totally missing out on it today because they think they have to pay for it themselves. And if that's you, I want you to be totally, once and for all, set free from this thing. Would you listen to the message of God from His Word today? You don't have to pay for it because it's already been paid for by Christ. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Can we pray together? Father, we understand that we are sinful people in the presence of a holy God and we're in awe of Your holiness. Father, guard us from that religious deception that attempts to place the burden of our salvation upon our own shoulders. We know we could never do it, but thank You that You can and that You did. Thank You that You paid the debt that we could never pay. Lord, if there's anybody listening to this message today who has never accepted Your salvation, anybody who's enslaved in the deception of false religion, anybody who's still struggling under the that impossible burden of trying to do this for themselves, we ask that today they might just believe the gospel, that they might believe that blessed message about how Christ went to the cross and died to pay the price for our sins, and He rose again. And we ask that they might this day just call out to You and trust the entire burden of their salvation into Your hands. 
For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.